Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are in a series of studies in the book of Jeremiah, and as I've told you, I've titled this uh, Studies in Jeremiah because we're not going through it chapter by chapter. I've just selected certain passages that I want to look at, and chapter 35 is our passage this morning, and it's an interesting passage about a mysterious group called the Rechabites, and so we'll study them this morning. Let me begin with verse 1. I'm not going to read the entire 18, rather 19 verses, but uh, to verse um, 13, beginning with verse 1, the word of the Lord, now, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, go to the house of the Rechabites and speak to them. And bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, son of Habazaniah, and his brothers and all the sons of the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, the son, the man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, which was above the chamber of Maasiah, the son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. Then I set before, set before the men of the house of the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, drink wine. But they said, we will not drink wine for Jonadab, the father of Rechab, or the, rather the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us saying, you shall not drink wine, you or your sons forever. You shall not build a house and you shall not sow seed and you shall not plant a vineyard or own one. But in tents you shall dwell all your days that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us not to drink wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, nor to build ourselves houses to dwell in. And we do not have vineyard or field or seed. We have only dwelt in tents, and have obeyed and have done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come, let us go to Jerusalem before the army of the Chaldeans and before the army of the Arameans. So we have dwelt in Jerusalem. Then the, Lord, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction by listening to my word, declares the Lord. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow together in a word of prayer and ask for his blessing. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche is notorious for declaring God is dead. By the end of his, of his life, he'd gone mad. So he's not someone we might expect to be quoted in a sermon. But in his book, Beyond Good and Evil, he did give a helpful description of commitment. He described it as being obedience for a long time in one direction. It's often quoted more simply as a long obedience in the same direction. Even that, though that comes from a committed non-Christian, really an anti-Christian, it still describes what ought to be true of a Christian. It's the obedience that was demonstrated in Jeremiah 35 when the prophet brought the Rechabites into the temple, put pitchers and cups of wine before them, invited them to drink. They didn't. And their refusal to drink wine, even at the word of a prophet, 
was an act of obedience that put them in sharp contrast to the men of Judah who were disobedient. That was the purpose of this incident, to give an example of a long obedience that would be a rebuke to a nation for its long disobedience. The Rechabites were loyal to a command given centuries earlier by a long dead ancestor, not even by God. While Judah could not be loyal to the word of the living God. That was a stinging rebuke. The incident is actually a flashback. It doesn't fit the chronology of the preceding or succeeding chapters, which happened during and after the last siege and destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Chapters 35 and 36 took place years earlier during the reign of Jehoiakim. But Jeremiah put them here in order to shine more light on Judah's disobedience. The order of the book, in the order of the book, I should say, it follows the uh, treachery of King Zedekiah and the men of Judah in chapter 34 when they freed their slaves in obedience to the word of God, obedience to the law, and then reneged and re-enslaved them. Terrible thing that was done, cruel thing. Judah was faithless, not loyal to God, not loyal to men. They were covenant breakers. So in contrast to men who break their promises, Jeremiah introduces men who keep their promises. So while chapter 35 is not in chronological order, happens 10 years or more before chapter 34, still it does follow a moral order. The chapter begins with the Lord instructing Jeremiah to go to the house of the Rechabites, bring them to the temple, to one of the side rooms, and give them wine to drink. Well, who were the Rechabites? They were not ethnically of the nation Israel. They were Kenites, which was a Midianite tribe that Moses lived with when he fled from Egypt. After the exodus, they joined Israel and they entered Canaan with them. We read about them in Judges chapter 1 and verse 16. They went up from Jericho and they settled in the tribal territory of Judah. In Judges 4 verse 11, we read of Heber, the Kenite, who with his wife Jael separated from the tribe and they moved north. They took part in Israel's war with the Canaanites when they fought Sisera. It was Jael who nailed a tent peg through Sisera's head when he fled the battle and sought refuge in her tent. In 1 Chronicles 2, verse 55, the Rechabites are listed as part of the tribe of Judah. So they eventually assimilated into the nation while at the same time keeping their distinct identity. Those of Jeremiah's generation were descendants of a man named Jonadab, who distinguished himself in 2 Kings verse 10, or chapter 10, when he joined Jehu during his bloody purge of the house of Ahab. After Jehu was anointed king and after he had killed many in Ahab's family, he rode to Samaria to finish off the family of Ahab. And on his way, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. Jehu asked him, Is your heart right as my heart is with your heart? He answered, It was. So Jehu took him up in his chariot and said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. He rode with him in his chariot to Samaria where Jehu killed everyone remaining in Ahab's family. Then he killed all the priests of Baal and he eradicated Baal worship from Israel. Seems clear from this that Jehu knew Jonadab well as a man devoted to the Lord and who hated idolatry. He was a witness to Jehu's zeal and the ancestor of these Rechabites. Jeremiah obeyed the Lord. He went to the house of the Rechabites and to Jehazaniah, 
who was probably the leader of the clan, he took him and his brothers and the whole house of the Rechabites to the temple, to one of the rooms there. The temple had rooms that were used for storage and living quarters for the priests. Jeremiah had a friend there, a man named Hanan, who in verse 4 is called the man of God. So Jeremiah wasn't alone in Judah as a man of God. There was a faithful remnant. The Lord always keeps a faithful remnant. He reminded Elijah of that uh, a century earlier when Elijah was um, feeling that he was the only uh, faithful one in Israel, the only one left. And the Lord said, no, I have 700 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. He always has a remnant, and here we have an example of that. They went to Hanan's chamber, and in verse 5, Jeremiah wrote, Then I set before the men of the house of the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, Drink wine. Well, that sounds like a pleasant afternoon. An invitation to the temple, a table set before them with pitchers of wine, and I can imagine that it's the finest wine in Jerusalem. But they refused. The Rechabites wouldn't drink. And in verses 6 through 11, they explain that they weren't being rude or ungrateful to the prophet. They were being faithful. They were men under orders. And they were obedient. Nearly 300 years earlier, their forefather, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, the head of their clan, had commanded them not to drink wine and not to build houses. They were not to sow seed or plant vineyards. They were to dwell in tents and live as nomads. And if they would do that, Jonadab promised, they would live in the land many days. And they had obeyed him for generations. They had obeyed him. They didn't drink wine. They didn't farm the land. They lived in tents all their days. They had carefully obeyed their ancestor. The only reason they were in Jerusalem and not out in their tents was because Nebuchadnezzar was overrunning the land. They were there for protection from the Babylonians. Verse 11, they give their explanation. We said, come Let us go to Jerusalem before the army of the Chaldeans and before the army of the Arameans. So we have dwelt in Jerusalem. Jonadab had wished for them many days in the land if they were obedient. But they didn't want to tempt God by ignoring danger. They they took the appropriate measures for their safety. They were there. They were in the city for that reason. Otherwise... They would have remained outside the walls in their tents as they had faithfully done for centuries. Their lives were lived largely apart from society. Maybe a little bit like the Amish of today. Their manner of life was in some ways a a throwback to the days of the patriarchs. The reason for that is not given. And the Rechabites did not seem to question the command that Jonadad had laid down for them. It wasn't because cities are evil or wine is sinful. The Bible doesn't prohibit either one. Jerusalem is called the city of the great king. And God blessed wine. In Psalm 104, verse 15, the psalmist wrote of wine which makes man's heart glad. We could multiply the verses like that from Proverbs 31, verse 6 and others. And of course, Christ's first miracle was changing water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana. And so forbidding wine is not biblical and it can be legalistic. On the other hand, Christians are not compelled to drink wine. We we are free And we are free not to do things as well as do things. We're free not to drink it. And we should abstain from from drinking any 
kind of alcohol, I would say, when that would be a problem for others around us. Paul discusses that under the subject of Christian liberty in Romans 14 and in 1 Corinthians 8, eating meat and drinking wine. A good rule on all of this is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. From what we know of Jonadab, that seems to have been the guiding principle for the commands that he gave. He was zealous for the Lord. He lived at the height of Baal worship in Israel. He was one of the 7,000, I would suspect, who had not bowed the knee to Baal. He saw the corruption of that religion. He saw the debauchery connected with it. Isaiah in the south, uh, generations before Jeremiah, a generation and a half or so before Jeremiah, wrote early in the book in chapter 5, verse 22, of the problem of alcohol. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men mixing strong drink. It's a way of mocking what was going on. They were abusing the gift of wine. So wine can be a problem. Proverbs 31 verse 4 states that wine is not for kings. And perhaps Jonadab wanted to ensure that his people avoided all temptation. Now we're not told, not told that. But I suspect that the reason for all of this was to preserve a nomadic way of life. Nomads couldn't produce wine. They could not plant vineyards or fields or build houses because they were always on the move. The reason he wanted to preserve that way of life may have been uh, spiritual in nature. It was perhaps to model the life of the patriarchs who lived in tents as strangers and exiles on the earth. They moved freely at God's command. It's how we are to live at least in our hearts, spiritually. We are to not be attached to this world. It's, it's not our place. We are pilgrims. We are passing through. The author of Hebrews speaks of that in Hebrews 11, about living for a heavenly country, not this place. That was what characterized the patriarchs who lived in tents, not cities. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Well, that's how the Rechabites lived, as strangers and aliens. It's how we're to live. We're to live like Rechabites, at least spiritually in that sense. And they lived that way, not tied to one place where they could produce and store up crops and wealth, which can lead to a life of luxury and uh, materialism. It's what happened to Israel early on in their history when they settled in Canaan and they began to prosper in the land of milk and honey. And as they did, their hearts were turned away from the Lord. They were drawn away from Him to the fertility cults of the Canaanites. So it seems in order to avoid that, the Rechabites chose a different life, an ascetic life, a, a hard life that requires discipline and denial and dependence on the Lord. And I say it seems that way. I'm, I'm speculating on the rationale for the commands of Jonadab. The reasons for, though, for that is not given. So as I say, it's speculation. And it may be that the Rechabites didn't know the reason for those commands, which adds force to their example. Even without explanation, they were obedient. Jonadab was their father. They didn't question him. They didn't need a reason for the command that he gave. They believed him, and so they stuck with the command. Even when they were invited into the temple, into the temple. What a place to be invited and offered large cups of wine from a prophet of God. Even then, they remained faithful to Jonadab. 
They could have easy, easily rationalized breaking the command. They, they were in a good place. They were with good people. They were the, with the best of people. And might, it might have seemed to them to be rather impolite to refuse the hospitality of a prophet. So there are ways in which they could have rationalized their way around being obedient to the command that had been given to them, which they had been so faithful to. But it was a test of that, a test of their fidelity, their commitment. And they proved constant in their commitment to the old command, even though it was a non-biblical command, and I don't mean by that an unbiblical command, but a command that was not given from the Lord or in His Word. And that's, that's really, I think, the point of this incident. It's not to commend their nomadic way of life or their asceticism. That was the instruction of a good man for a good reason, though we don't have the reason, but we can assume it was a good reason. But God had not commanded it. What is commended, what is uh, uh, approved, is their faithfulness. That's the lesson they give to Judah. Their reverence for a, a, a and, and their long obedience to their great ancestor stands in stark contrast to Judah's infidelity to the Lord, their God. The Rechabites were living a living sermon and rebuke to Judah. Now that rebuke is given in the rest of the chapter in verses 12 and 13. The Lord instructed Jeremiah to give the nation the lesson of the Rechabites. Their example should shame the people into obedience. The message is given in verses 14 through 16. In contrast to the nation which had disobeyed God in spite of the many messengers that he had sent to the nation, the Rechabites had consistently obeyed the command of one man who had long since died. Well, the Lord instructs Jeremiah to give the lesson, and the lesson is stated in verses 14, 15, and 16. The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are observed. So, they do not drink wine to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. But I have spoken to you again and again, yet you have not listened to me. Also, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them again and again, saying, Turn now every man from his evil way and amend your deeds and do not go after other gods to worship them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your, to your forefathers, but you have not inclined your ear or listened to me. Indeed, the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have observed the command of their father, which he commanded them, but this people has not listened to me. The rebuke here is similar to one that God gave at the beginning of the book of, Je of uh, Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Dumb animals are obedient to God, but God's own people, His chosen people, whom He blessed with freedom and prosperity, aren't obedient. That's a terrible indictment on Israel, and really an indictment on all of mankind. The same rebuke is true from the world's loyalty to some cause or person. They sometimes put to shame our our loyalty or our lack of loyalty to the Lord and His, His commands. And Christ made that kind of contrast Himself on numerous occasions during His ministry. He would draw on nature for illustrations and sometimes use the world 
and its ways to instruct his disciples on proper conduct. He did that, for example, in Luke chapter 16, a very interesting parable, kind of a surprising parable when he told of the unrighteous servant who was fired for squandering his master's possessions. And so fearing for his future, he cut deals with all of his master's debtors in order to get in their good standing so that when he was dismissed from his master's house, he would be welcomed into their homes. And Jesus praised him for his shrewdness. And in contrast to him, and as a a rebuke to us, said, the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. The Lord, of course, wasn't praising the man's dishonesty. He doesn't set him forth as a pattern of morality, but as a pattern of resourcefulness in planning for the future. He used an example about evil to make a point about good. Worldly people are often wiser and more diligent with their time and resources for temporal ends than God's people are with their spiritual tools and time for eternal ends. We can learn lessons from the world. Their diligence in business or politics, their sacrifices for things of fading value often put us to shame and and should shame us in a good sense into better conduct. Jeremiah 35 is a lesson similar to that, though it's not really secular, and it certainly is not about bad people doing bad things. It's about good people and loyalty. It's about faithfulness and obedience. And faithfulness for a far less compelling reason than Judah had for being faithful. Jonadab was wise and godly, but he was not a prophet. He'd not spoken God's word. Still, his descendants had obeyed him at great sacrifice. They'd given up the comforts of houses and the pleasures of wine and other things to obey a mere man whom they had not personally known. This is generations later, but they're still loyal to his word, even though it was spoken long before them. Yet God's people had not been loyal to him, to the God of the universe whose commands are perfect, even though he had spoken to them through the prophets, as he said again and again. The blessings God promised for obedience. This goes all the way back to Deuteronomy, but He promises it again here. The blessings for obedience are great. The people would remain in the land. That means the Babylonians would never have overthrown them regardless of how great their army was. Never have defeated Judah had they been obedient to Him. But they weren't. They were consistently disobedient. So the contrast between the Rechabites and the people of Judah is very clear. And it's a lesson for the world. From the dawn of human history, man has been disobedient. The history of the human race has been one of rebellion from the beginning. Men assert their independence from God in an attempt to find happiness, fulfillment. Really, in an attempt to be God and rule their own lives. They want autonomy, self-direction, but it can't be done. We live and move and exist in God. We can't get away from Him. It's foolish to think one can do that, and it leads ultimately always, always to disaster. Men cannot disregard God and His revelation. If He is there and true, then He must act When man disobeys, he is the God of grace, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Long-suffering, but he's also the God of justice. He is holy, and he must judge sin. 
The author of Hebrews reminds us of that in a very startling verse in Hebrews 10.31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, that was the consequence of Judah's failure and the pronouncement of verse 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, you don't want to hear a pronouncement of judgment from the God of hosts. Behold, I am bringing on Judah and on all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, because I spoke to them, but they did not listen. And I have called them, but they did not answer. So there's no surprise in this. The Lord had warned them time and time again. He'd sent them messenger after messenger. He had been patient with this people, but like a rebellious child, Judah refused to listen. And so judgment now had to come. Had to come. In contrast to the condemnation of Judah is the Lord's commendation of the Rechabites. Chapter ends with that. Verse 18, then Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab your father, kept all his commands, and done according to all that he commanded you. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab shall not lack a man to stand before me always. The blessing here may be as simple as a promise that the Rechabites will never be destroyed as a family. And in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 14, a descendant of Rechab is mentioned about 150 years later who was faithfully serving the Lord and repairing one of the gates of Jerusalem. H.A. Ironside saw something even greater in this promise. He wrote, The family of this devoted man has long since been lost to history, both sacred and profane. But we gather from this promise that somewhere in this world his descendants still exist. And doubtless in the millennium, when all prophecies regarding Israel and Judah are fulfilled, the house of Rechab will once more appear upon the scene a testimony to the faithfulness of him who is not a man that he should lie. Maybe. God is faithful to his word. Perhaps that will be the fulfillment of it. Now there are some practical lessons for us from the example of the Rechabites, such as keeping promises, honoring parents, about being careful with food and drink, uh, lessons about materialism. But chiefly in, in all of this is the lesson that God honors loyalty. God blesses those who keep their vows. He doesn't require that we take vows, but when we do, we must keep them. That's an important lesson for the church, particularly in a day of disloyalty like ours. In Marriage, men break their vows. In business, they break their agreements and contracts. We, we live in a, a faithless age. Men think that God doesn't see or God doesn't care. He's indifferent to it. That's Psalm 50. That's the error that's cited in Psalm 50 where God says, you thought that I was just like you. You thought that I look at things the way you look at things. That I ignore the things you ignore. You thought that I was just like you. Now consider this, he said, or I will tear you in pieces. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is there. He is not like us. He sees all and he will judge. Otherwise, he would not be God. The God of grace is the God of justice. And it, it doesn't matter if men think that that is unfair or think that that's untrue. It is true. And it's always fair. It's always just. Now, that is a word of warning for the world. Not to be scary or vengeful, 
but to alert the unbelieving to the danger of unbelief, the danger of dismissing God, uh, of, of ignoring Him and His Word. God is not mocked. He's the source of truth. He is the basis of reality. People do not live in connection with reality when they ignore God and don't figure Him into the, to things. So men cannot deny Him without, without consequences. Nietzsche said God is dead, and He died a madman. Rejection of the Lord is deadly. But this chapter is really written to God's people. It was to the people of Judah, who were in unbelief, but they are God's chosen people. And I think the proper application of this passage is to the church. We're to be obedient. We're not to conform to the world and its faithlessness. We are to be different. We are to live apart. We're to stand out like the Rechabites who were obedient in a faithless, disobedient age. In the church, husbands and wives are to love one another and be faithful to one another. Children are to, to obey their parents. The, the Christian home should be a model and witness to the world. Each of us individually are to practice obedience. We're like the Rechabites in that they were people under orders. We are too. In fact, how do we compare to the Rechabites? How committed are we? I think that's a question we ought to be asking ourselves. Is, is ours a long obedience in the same direction and in the right direction? If not, it should be. But if it's not, how do we get it? And I say if it's not, none of us, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, are happy with our lives of obedience. We all see failures in there because we all do fail. And we will struggle with that to the day we die. But the question should be asked of ourselves, how do we get that obedience? Life is short and, and we want our lives to count for the Lord that we do if we are people who belong to the Lord, if we're His children, His sons and daughters. But I think an old Presbyterian theologian, James Henley Thornwell, had the answer. He wrote, Love is the expression of that state of the heart which will induce and ensure universal obedience. I think that's absolutely right. Love for the Lord is what is going to induce and ensure obedience. How do we get that? Well, the only way to cultivate love is to live in God's Word. Study His Word, His revelation, and in studying His revelation, learn of His person, learn of His work, learn of His holy character, his mercy and His grace. He is the, the energizer that, uh, that enables us to do that very thing, to live for Him. He's the one that in, ensures that we do. We can't do these things. We can't do that in the flesh, in our own strength. We can only do it by His grace, and His grace is sufficient and powerful. But still, we need to set our minds to do it. We're responsible to do that, to discipline ourselves, and be willing to give things up for that, if necessary. But whatever we give up cannot compare to what we'll gain from Him as we spend our time where we ought to spend it, doing what we ought to be doing, learning of Him and living for Him and walking with Him. It pays with rich rewards. It gives knowledge and wisdom and it increases our faith. You want strong faith? You want a better life of faith? Read the Word of God. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Well, that's the way to a strong faith, a persevering faith, which produces a long obedience. It will make Rechabites of us who stand out as a witness to a faithless world and a weak and worldly church. And that's the witness that the people of God need. May God 
in his grace, produce that in us and use us in that way. But if you're here without Christ, if you've not believed in him, that is where you must begin, recognizing that you're lost, that you're a sinner, that you're guilty. We all are. I'm not standing up here pointing the finger at sinners. We're all sinful. We've fallen. That's, that's the condition of everyone without exception. There's only one person who is an exception to that, and that's the one who came to save us. And because he is the exception to that, the Son of God is the Savior of the world. He died for sinners. He died in their place. He suffered God's wrath for all who believe in him. So believe in him. Join yourself to him through faith. And then in his power, in the power of his grace, live for him who has given you eternal life. Or maybe we all do that and set our minds to do it. Let's stand and sing in conclusion hymn number seven in the Songs of Praise book, Be Thou My Vision. Hymn number seven and then remain standing for the benediction. Lord, we do pray for a vision of you. We pray that you give us a clear, abiding understanding of your goodness and grace, your long-suffering nature, all that you've done for us. In light of this passage, your faithfulness to us. And we understand that and then live lives that are pleasing to you and helpful to one another, a good witness before the world. We're dependent upon you for that just as we're dependent upon you for our salvation, and we thank you for it, the free gift of life eternal in your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.